Support for the Langcast is provided by Winey Way Books and Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Welcome to the Langcast. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slesser. This episode, we spoke with Scott Herzog, host and creator of the Sci Fi Diner podcast. Scott shares about building the podcast up to the point where he felt comfortable approaching celebrities for interviews. We stumbled into it. It wasn't really we're good enough to approach a star. We had, a, first of all, we 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 tried to get in as publicity. We were we were not interested at all in interviewing guests. But we hooked up with a guy at publicity. He said, "Hey, you know, can I can I come on your show and promote?" Surely, I said, "Sure, come on in." And he also, in, in the midst of that, said, "You know, if you're interested in interviewing our guests, you can, you know, you know, do that." And I said. Okay, and so after we got those interviews, we began to you know we asked people on Twitter, on Facebook, and our philosophy was that you could always say no. Later in the show, we get down to the nitty gritty with Scott about sci-fi issues. If you didn't watch Battlestar Galactica by now, it's been over what, four years. Now, <laughs> five years but you know, probably not that. Probably like two or three years. But I thought, especially the ending of that, when they bring it into the curtain, and you see the robots. At the end, doing I'm like, oh, we're heading that direction. You know, <laughs> you know, so. Enjoy the conversation. Well, Scott, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of what the Sci-Fi Diner podcast is? Sci-Fi Diner podcast is a podcast that discusses sci-fi. I mean, our science fiction in general and uh uh, we, we cover a bunch of different things. We have uh, trivia we do, uh, weekly, I guess monthly trivia that we give away, you know, odds and ends of prizes. Obviously cover the news of what's going on, you know, with the the Avengers coming out. I can't wait for that. Uh, um, and, and what, the Hunger Games, and we're, we're hitting it like some of the news. And then typically we do an interview, and it's a show where we wrap up with a Sci-Fi 5 and 5. And that's the uh, framework of really one of our shows. Um and then we have a couple others that we do. We do a sci-fi rewind where we kind of watch a movie that's maybe 20 years old or so, and we just kind of discuss it and its relevancy and how it's held up over time and what we think about it. And a lot of times it's movies either I haven't watched or, you know, or I haven't watched in a really long time. Um, and then we also do a um, listener feedback episode where our listeners kind of either call in or write in and or we discuss things that they're talking about and stuff that we're watching where we can spoil the heck out of it because we try to be fairly spoiler-free on our show. So what we mean by that is we try not to give away what the TV shows we are talking about. You know, if there's a recent episode, you try not to reveal that to our listeners who may not have watched it. Oh, so. Like uh, Darth Vader being Luke's father? Right, right, right. No, we, we, <laughs> we, we spoiled uh, I haven't that. seen that one yet. <laughs> we, we spoil the heck out of that. If you didn't know that, you can't call yourself a geek. <laughs> Nothing about being a sci-fi geek if you haven't watched that by now. Okay, so so this is just something that's part of the name. Of do you eat when you do this? Or you uh, just... Absolutely. <laughs> you know, let me tell you the history of the name a little bit. We started out, when we started out, I'm a huge Douglas Adams fan. Uh-huh. Um, yes. You know, it's a restaurant at the end of the universe. We had a, um, the podcast was originally called Dining at the End of the Universe, kind of an homage to the restaurant at the end of the universe. And then you got sued. No. We didn't. <laughs> and actually, I'm surprised, like, no one said anything with Sci-Fi Diner, because Sci-Fi Diner is this little eating establishment out of Disney World. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that they, 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 like, drive in B-50, I guess, uh, 50 After B-movies. this episode, yeah. you will. Get some right, probably. So, <laughs> yeah, so next week. No, be, uh, <laughs> lawsuit, you know, cease and desist. Sci-Fi uh, restaurant next yeah. year. <laughs> uh, um, but... So it was Dining at the Universe for the first uh, 24 episodes, and then we rebranded at episode 25 and became the Sci-Fi Diner. Still the same feel, same intent, and it's kind of grown to be more diner-esque. Like, we have a menu that we serve up. It's our kind of the agenda for the show, and um, we kind of sometimes joke about, you know, there's Sci-Fi Diner drinking songs and you know, <laughs> our drinking uh, shots every time we say – every time, like, Scott mispronounces some, you know, actor's name because they can't pronounce the names worth the darn, you know, you take a <laughs> shot. Or you play bingo or whatever you want to play with it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of evolved over time uh, from that, and uh, we, we try to get the diner feel a little bit into it. So, Let's talk a little bit about getting started. What inspired you to podcast and then <laughs> – uh, how did you convince your wife to let you take it from that to what you're doing now? Yeah, my wife. You've, if you've listened to the show regularly, you've heard my wife. Uh, Kristen Herzog, of course, was on for the Haitian Connection Network. And a little plug for her, she's actually in Haiti now. Nice. So it's very cool. So I'm playing Mr. Mom this week. Uh, 
what got me started in the podcasting was I was at an in-service day. I'm a school teacher by trade. I teach at Penn Manor High School. I'm an English teacher there. And I was at an in-service day, a technology in-service day. I guess it was early 2008, maybe, something like that. And they were talking about podcasting, you know, and I've, you know, I've, I've been into audio. I've been in a couple bands over the years and uh, I've done some of my own recording. And so it was kind of interesting to me. And I thought, well, how can I use this? And I, and I began to listen to podcasts at that point. I was unaware of them until about 2008. And I began to listen to, you know, Extra Life Radio, a few gaming podcast. Um, uh, the Instance, which is a World of Warcraft uh, podcast, so I, I used to play that a lot. Dedicated way too many years of my life to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Uh, and uh, began to listen to um, some podcasts on podcasting, and, and soon I began to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. And so summer of that year, when school started the next year, I did um, – a short podcast called Room 312 because I teach in Room 312 at Penn Manor. Uh, and it was just many little lessons that I was doing with my students that I was kind of podcasting, putting on iTunes so they could access it. Um, and then I also started a podcast that ran for about seven episodes called So a Catholic and a Protestant Walk into a Bar. And it was a <laughs> friend of mine had, had become Catholic, and we were talking about that journey as a Protestant-Catholic relationship, right? Uh -huh. And he was actually on a journey to become a priest. He's now in his like third year seminary or something. And that relationship really developed out of this. The Sci-Fi Diner kind of came out of that relationship because he was my original co-host. Don Bender was the original co-host of the Sci-Fi Diner podcast. And and that's really uh, kind of where it kind of all developed from there. And then I guess January of that year, we started a podcast called Haiti in Focus, which focused on Haiti-related stuff, and then the Sci-Fi Diner, and another small one called Fireside Book Chat. It was probably one of the bigger pod <laughs> bigger podcasts I do. So, so you still uh, doing the fireside? The fireside um, I stopped in January because uh, I just didn't have time. I began to do some audiobook recording at that time, mm -hmm. and that ate up way too much of my time. <laughs> I sold my uh, soul to uh, record an audiobook for a, a wonderful author named Aaron Rosenberg, who wrote a book called No Small Bills, which is very Douglas Adams like. So. So you're, yeah. re you're reading the book? Or you yeah, I did. It's done. I wow. sent in the last chapter this morning. So, oh, wow. so, so ho hopefully, unless there's any re-records, I'm done with it for now. So right. Very cool. So when you get like an audible.com uh, well, that's what it, it, you can, you can spawn, say, and yeah. my recommendation is, right, right, you okay. want to hear my sexy voice tomorrow. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So... But that's how I can, that's how I kind of uh, the Sci-Fi Diner kind of came out of that and and uh, you know it was kind of my outlet my way to kind of connect with uh, uh, the guys I guess and over the years my my love of sci-fi really began to blossom and I was having conversations with Don Bender naturally anyways so it was kind of like well let's podcast what we talk about and that's what it really originally came out of we were just talking about the shows we were watching like Stargate Battlestar Galactica Doctor Who and and you know, just began to share that, and and then around episode eleven, we did our first interview, and a couple episodes later, we did another one. And we said, you know, we like this format, kind of like what you guys said. We like this format. Let's let's try this interview format, you know. And our, our first guest was Miracle Larry from Dollhouse and uh, the TV show Dollhouse by Josh Whedon, and uh, mm -hmm. kind of went off from there. So, and mostly interviews. So, well, you reached out to a show that was currently airing with semi decent ratings i know it's it's kind of beloved beloved dollhouse uh, a lot of people like it i i'm not too familiar with it myself but what was it like to i mean what did you have to coax yourself up to to say okay i think that we're at this level at um that was what 25 ep episodes in right yeah like, okay after, we've done this for 25 episodes i think we're good enough to to, to approach like a semi star you know we stumbled into it it wasn't really we're good enough to approach a star we had <laughs> We had um, we wrote to Shore Leave, the Shore Leave Convention, which meets in uh, Baltimore, and they actually have one coming up in August this year again. Uh, and have, you know, you know, Catherine Mulgrew will be there, and uh, Levar Burton, and a lot of the Next Generation staff will be there. Ryan Robbins from Sanctuary, and Reese Robbins, I guess it is. But um, we kind of stumbled into it. First of all, we 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 tried to get in as publicity. We were we were not interested at all in interviewing guests um but we hooked up with a guy of publicity he said hey you know can i can i come on your show and promote shore leave i said sure come on in and, and so he came on 
And he also, in, in the midst of that, said, you know, if you're interested in interviewing our guests, you can, you know, you know, do that. And I said, oh, okay. And um, and so Miracle Lari was there. We, of course, were following Dollhouse at the time, so we were kind of excited about that. And um, oh, Christopher Heyerdahl, who's in uh, New Moon and uh, some of the Twilight movies and has done stuff for Stargate and uh, and Sanctuary, if you watch that. Um, uh, the... the uh, Zena's daughter, um, Adrian Wilkinson, who did stuff for The Force Unleashed, was there. And uh, a little unknown name by a guy by the name of Cliff Simon that eventually ended up in Star Trek, uh, the newest movie by J.J. Abrams. Uh, and it was also in a movie, a TV series called The Event. And so we ran into actors like that and we said, okay, well, sure, we'll interview them. And uh, that's kind of how this all transpired you know just kind of stumbling into it and so after we got those interviews we began to you know be asked people on twitter on facebook and you know that we were following you know would you be interested in doing an interview with us and our philosophy was that you could always say no you know you don't ask if you don't ask you don't get anything but if you if you ask the worst thing that can happen is they say no and so and some actors don't respond, and the next ones, I think Twitter has made actors and celebrities and authors a little bit more accessible to the audience. And uh, a lot of them, if they can't set up the interview, they'll at least hook you up with their agent. So, so that's kind of the way we, uh, a lot of our non-convention interviews are done that way. So, I know what you mean about just kind of throwing it out there and yeah, see, you know. You know, the other thing that uh, has begun to happen in the past year is we have people that are contacting us now saying, hey, we want to be on the Sci-Fi Diner. Comedy Central had done that with Ugly Americans, which isn't the show I really watch. But they said, hey, you know, we... previews for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it and it, uh, it's not my type of show, but, you know, they contacted us and said, hey, can we put on? And we had a great interview with the guy as the creator and the producer of that show. And... Um, uh, there was a, a guy from the Stargate Atlanta show that was doing a movie, and he came on. They contacted us for that, and some authors will contact us to be on. And Chase Masterson from uh, Deep Space Nine had contacted us to talk about a project that she was doing. And so people do contact you as well, and that's actually the easiest part when they actually contact you. And then <laughs> they, it's just a matter of arranging it. They want to be on your show, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Scott Ziegler, who we um, just, I guess, they released that episode, I guess, Monday. Uh, they had contacted us back in February saying, hey, we have a book coming out nocturnal. And I had read some of, or listened, when I say read, I listened to some of Scott Ziegler's stuff. And and and, and it is, I was glad, glad to have him on the show. So, Well, this, is, this brings us to a bigger question. Um, some of your guests... Uh, Trisha Halfer and Felicia Day have been waiting to date me. So can I get right. their numbers from you? Is that, yeah, is that something was, that can I happen? Think there was some kind of a mix-up in the mail right, or something. Right, like right. Like, I think the best number I can get you is those. maybe uh, Tori Higginson. I have her personal phone number. She was the uh, head woman from Stargate Atlantis before Samantha Tapp uh, Amanda, Amanda Tapping took over. Ah, uh, yes. Um, but no, we you know... <laughs> We don't get their numbers. Uh, you know, when we see them at uh, the conventions, they aren't typically giving out their digits. I think they're holding out on me. We do get time to uh, uh. spend with them, and we do get our pictures with our arms around them, and sometimes our cameras fail, you know, so we can stand there a little bit longer. But <laughs> do, uh, do you do the, when you do the hand or the arms around, do you hold the, like, hover your arm? Over oh, no, you do right, that. So right on. Whoa! Oh, he actually it's somebody's her. balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Felicia Day. I think about you. You mentioned Felicia. She's probably one of the most. Is there a big sweat stain or not? <laughs> 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 Maybe in miles, and hopefully he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> now, you know, uh, Felicia Day especially was really accessible to the guests. I think one of the things that you find is that people that come to conventions to talk that they're there to meet with their fans. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means as a general rule, they're of a, a pretty good demeanor and they're, they're, you know, pending. They don't have any legal issues, uh, as far as doing interviews and stuff. We had, um, uh, Kirsten or Kristen, one of the ladies from True Blood, wouldn't interview us because of some uh, non-disclosure agreement she had with HBO that they really monitored who she interviewed. But other than that, people are typically accessible and friendly, and they're more than if you they're more than willing, more than willing to do the interview with you. Uh, and um, I can't think of anyone that really uh, refused us at the conventions. Mm -hmm. So, or maybe early on there were, but recent conventions, I think we've interviewed almost every guest. 
No, no, you didn't drool or have your tongue hanging out. With you, <laughs> no, so David. No, I wasn't. I, I, I was kind of in all of Trisha Day and uh, um, <clears throat> was kind of in uh, all of Trisha. And uh, she's she's stunning in person. Mm -hmm. She's stunning in TV, but she's stunning in person and uh, and gracious and uh, was really cool. So same with uh, we interviewed Q around the same time, and that's he was just wonderful. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> yeah, now, and you know it's. Um, I think probably one of our favorite interviews, I think Miles would probably agree with this, is with Edward James Olmos. Oh, uh, you nice. Know, and uh, we'd interviewed him, and he spent all day at the convention floor talking and, and uh, you know, during his sessions and then, you know, signing autographs, talking to the guests. And at the end of his day, he said, yeah, I'll interview. So he took us back to his room, and we sat there, and he was tired. But he gave us like 45 minutes of interview and just was very gracious, you know. Seems is he like as a, badass in person as he is in the uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, but he, he's a person that he's a person that knows what he wants. Right. Um, and so when people call him up to do a role, he gets what he wants. Mm. You know, basically he says because he's he, you know, basically he's that caliber of actor. He says, Look, if you aren't gonna give this to me, I don't want to do it. And same way with Battlestar and with Mammy Bice and some of the other stuff he did. My friends and I we we judge people's anger. We're like, well, did they Adama out? Yeah, the yeah. scenes where he like he's so calm, and all of a sudden he'll be crazy and like knock everything over. Yeah. Those yeah. are always the best. And uh, star scene. we, of course, most recently we haven't aired the interview yet, but we interviewed Michael Hogan. And if you listen to the beginning of the one podcast that we released, he's chewing out Miles in, uh, <laughs> as Colonel Ty in uh, Battlestar Galactica. So. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it was very, it was very cool. He loved it. So it's great. <laughs> Well, we're going to head to break. Can we come back? We'll have more with Scott. Hey, everybody. We're here at Penn Cinema to find out what everyone's been talking about. Excuse me. Why do you choose Penn Cinema? I like the seats. They're really comfy. <laughs> They're a lot nicer than most other places. Even my house. <laughs> oh, well, this place is great. I mean, it's popcorn. We've got, some, uh, we've got a slushy machine over there. Found, we got three clocks. Three clocks for the Lidditz, the Lancaster, and the effort of time, just in case, you know, you don't know what time it is in your area. That's why I love this place. They, they, they think about everybody, you know. Very friendly. Has a nicer environment. It's clean and comfortable. It feels independent. You know, like, it doesn't feel like part of a system. Like, it feels like as big as it is and as polished as it is that it feels independent, you know? Bigger screen, better quality. So it's really close. It's very clean. We come here all the time. What do you like about Penn Cinema? The seats are my favorite thing. Very comfortable. On the rump. <laughs> <laughs> 3D IMAX, the whole shebang. It has a down-home feel, and we love the atmosphere that Penn has created. He really tries to take into account what people want in a theater. It's really clean, and the seats are really comfy. <laughs> Yeah, I like the seats. It's the best movie theater to come to. Well, you've heard what they have to say. Now come see for yourself. Check out Penn Cinema for first-class movies in a first-rate theater. Located at 541 Airport Road in Lidditz, PA. And we're back with Scott Herzog. Hey. So, hey. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> So, Scott, you said earlier uh, Douglas Adams was kind of uh, his uh, restaurant at the end of the universe was kind of the inspiration for the name of your podcast. Uh, I just had this question right away. It's a little question, but um, what do you think of the movie adaptation from the books? Which movie adaptation? The, the, le the most, most recent? recent one, not the, not the one on. You know, uh, I went and saw in theater. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm Douglas, as I said, a Douglas Adams fan, and... It doesn't. The movie did not catch for me what made Douglas Adams so fun, and that is when you read a Douglas Adams book. Are they funny, witty? Absolutely. But then there's also the satirical nature of his book, where they really begin to talk about stuff that's current. You know, so let's get rid of Earth because we're going to put in a superhighway, or you know, that sort of thing. And and the stuff that becomes almost funny because you can kind of see our culture in it. And for me, that's what made Douglas Adams such a great read. Um, especially the Hitchhiker books, right. you know. I, I guess that's the the short answer of it. And so, okay, you passed the grade, okay. right? Right, right. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm not a you, are a, you are a true Douglas yeah. Adams fan. I, yes, I, yes, I was so. just, that was a test question. That's right. <laughs> so if they came out with a sequel, I'd probably see it, but it wouldn't be you know if right. they, unless they do it right, you know. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I watched I watched the movie too, and I, th I felt that it was lacking yeah. a certain Douglas Adams. Although he apparently was part of the. 
a little bit of it before he died right. uh, as part of the uh, uh, management of it or whatever. So yeah, the song about the fish was great. That's about it. Yeah, <laughs> so, I won't sing it for you because my voice is not real keen, but I could. <laughs> I have a normal day. So um, for me, I, I want to ask you. We talked a little bit about your Stargate people coming on. What is your favorite Stargate? Because mine is Universe. You know, they are so different. Oh, um, gosh, I guess yeah. SG-1 and and, uh, and and what's called SD, are, for those of you that are sci-fi fans, Stargate, um, just Stargate, and then Stargate Atlantis, and then uh, Stargate Universe, all had slightly different feels to them. But especially the first two were tended to be these kind of one-offs of the week with an overarching storyline story that kind of loosely held them together. Um, and we began to see that change with the Universe, and Universe was much more... Yeah, well, it, I, I heard it was called. How did I hear it described? It was like a Battlestar Galactica meets, um, oh, I don't know, Stargate, I guess. But the, the the drama was much more intense. The character really began to play out, and it became less about um, the joking and fun episodes that you got, even though that was there to some degree, and much more of a serious. How in the heck are we going to survive being stranded, in, you know, in a galaxy far, far away, you know, and. So I appreciate it. I was really sad to leave to see it go. And the last episode, when they kind of pan through the ship and they show you the Stargate one last time lit up, and David, you know, David Blue's character is sitting on the bridge, just looking out at the universe as he goes along. It's just probably the best ending they could give for a show that was canceled, you know, yeah. in my opinion. But um, well, I could argue that, but we'll continue. yeah, no, we, we can argue maybe after the show. If you, don't want to argue that, but, you know, it's it's just a um, it was such a uh, a good show, and I, I really miss having not any Stargate on the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe someday. Well, they talked about making the movies, and then they're yes, just like, you know, they lost their money. Yeah, they lost it. And uh, I, I heard rumors that Roland Emmerich, who did the first original one prior to all these, is, you know, supposedly thinking of doing another one, and, you know, who knows whether that'll happen. Independence Day, supposedly, according to Christopher Judge, was kind of the sequel to it but it didn't feel like a sequel <laughs> well since we're talking about endings and I want to argue I have to bring up my favorite show of all time not just my favorite sci-fi but my favorite show and that's Farscape uh, I love Farscape now when they got cancelled it was last minute and they decided as nephew they'd give a to be continued for their last episode Right. Well, they, did they follow it up with the Peacekeeper Wars? They did. Yeah, they yeah. did. So yeah. even though it left you hanging, they did bring some resolution and then followed it with... That was fan-funded, too. Yeah, and they had, uh, uh, or at least fan-driven. And I, I know that the, uh, they also continued it through the comic books that people have followed, and mm -hmm. I think they're just wrapping that up. I know one of the authors we've interviewed in the show that does some of the Farscape comics, and... Um, I know that they kind of wrapped it up, so they did bring. They were able to bring some closure, but some some shows don't get any closure at all. So, <laughs> so, but yeah, that would be a terrible way to cancel a show. Yeah, well, it was it was, it was there, so. I'm sorry, guys. I was say, there, I was, you're saying about no, some shows getting no, no closure at all. I was really into that show, which a lot of my friends thought was stupid, but that show Surface that was on for a while. It was on uh, one it, season. It was Spielberg, right? Yeah, Spielberg show. But it was on. It was on one season, and at the end of the season, it just. And then they just canceled it and didn't right, bring it back the next right. the next season. And I was just like, I was, I, for now, my life like I have nightmares about this. <laughs> like what? what are they, they were trapped in the steeple of a church with water all around and the monsters. What do they do? And then so that was the end of the. <laughs> <season>. <laughs> I was like, I could imagine an ending to it, but that's just not as good. Yeah. <laughs> I think the best way that the show can close a season, if they're if they're in question or if they know they're in question early enough is to wrap up the storyline and leave some questions that if they get another season, they can continue. Um, but these shows that kind of leave you cold turkey, you're like, ah, you know, it's just, you know, is what it is, I guess. See, I thought Battlestar Galactica ended really well. Uh, some people would debate you on the on the yeah. last final episode. I actually liked the final episode, I but I'm one of, I'm one of the few, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. I like it too. So. So I thought I thought it was good. I thought yeah. they ended it well. They brought it I, back to Earth, and and I thought what was <laughs> eerie. Spoiler. Yeah, <laughs> if you didn't watch Battlestar Galactica by now, it's been over what four years. Five years. <laughs> but you know, probably not that. It's probably more like two or three years. But I thought, especially the ending of that, when they bring it into the current, you see the robots. At the end, I'm like, oh, we're heading that direction. You know? <laughs> you know, so. So, uh, 
it fit perfect with the record because this has all happened before, you know, right. <laughs> and this will yeah. all happen again. Like it just kind of was like, yeah, that's good. Which I, is, I which, bought it. Which brings me to the whole zombie versus <laughs> robot takeover of the world. Right. Just want to get your opinion on this. I personally think the whole zombie thing is uh, unlikely, whereas the Skynet Cylon attack <laughs> is definitely uh, a little bit more plausible more to you. Plausible to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the question? So, the question is <laughs> your, your opinion on this. Does he have a question? Or he just wants to talk about. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I'm actually getting my views out there in right. the eyes of a right, question. Right, right, right. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Um, uh, I think that the uh, both are real plausible threats, and. Um, and uh, I'm in the process of digging my bunker and stockpiling my weapons for when the zombie apocalypse comes. And uh, and I've firewalled all my computers and uh, and have uh, multiple times and have tried to get myself off the grid, you know, with the solar power that we have in the house, so that Skynet cannot, <laughs> so Skynet cannot take over. And so I'm kind of attacking from both fronts, just in case uh, um, something happens. Uh, that I can kind of protect my family and, you know. Here's my thoughts on the zombie apocalypse. I, I just, I think it's, I, I don't know. I look at it and I'm like, why couldn't we organize some sort of defense right. faster? Like, I just... Seriously, they're mindless. They're not. Well, I don't know so much what we're talking about, but I just feel like there would be more even, even survivors the, than right, right. most of the shows. Right, right. Movies or whatever. I, uh, yeah. I, it depends how I guess it depends how it hits, but I'm not <laughs> right. Is, is it hitting like all of a sudden like a certain amount of people are zombies and attacking and you know? Hey, at least the zombies are showing right now aren't in sparkly capes. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and now you know my views about Twilight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're not vampires. <laughs> Uh, now, if you give me Underworld, I'm okay with that. Yes, because yeah. the Underworld franchise, I'm totally there. Although I didn't see the most recent one, and but the 3D one. Well, whatever. Yeah. So I've been watching some of like the in between, like like uh, Buffy and and uh, Angel, yeah. and and there's like sort of quirky, uh, uh, you know, annoyingness part of that. You know, where they they throw in like funny little stupid stuff, but. But I still, I love, I've been watching it. It's entertaining. It's keeping me entertained. It yeah. doesn't really have much of a storyline. But my goal, my goal for one, my goal one day is to go through Buffy. I huh. probably watched the first seven episodes, and that's it. Um, I'm a huge David David Boreanaz fan. You know the guy that played Angel. He's so dreamy. <laughs> oh yeah. He, 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 uh, and because of it, I'm a huge fan of Bones. The only reason I watch Bones. No. <laughs> Not Forget quite. Felicia Day. Let's talk oh, yes. about Boreanaz. <laughs> Sorry, Felicia. You know, uh, either that or Eddie McClintock, who looks like David Boreanaz. And, yeah. um, <laughs> so I had a chance to actually. We didn't interview him, but I had a chance to talk with Eddie, and uh, oh, nice. we tried to line up an interview. It never happened at the show, and we said we'll do it afterwards. And of course, it never happened. You know, it happens sometimes. But um, so. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but I'm not a fan of the sparkly vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I just started watching Buffy, and I am in the second season. And yeah. I have to say, I was really not liking the first season. Second season's a lot more interesting. Yeah. Uh, See, I've I, never seen it before. So. I've, I've watched like episodes of Buffy like on Hulu back before you had to Hulu Plus. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, when Hulu first came out, I was watching a bunch of those episodes. So I got enough of it, and then I sort of have switched over to Angel. Like Now my, my parents got... Hulu Plus, and I've hacked into their password and stuff, so I use it. <laughs> yeah, uh, Hulu, you're not listening to this podcast right now. <laughs> yeah, they, they already know. It's just my mom, I know my mom's email address, and she uses the same password for like everything. So, <laughs> share that information. With the really world. By great. the way, her email is, and her password is. No, it's right. Right. Uh, right. And now everyone can access now Hulu everyone Plus. Everyone can watch Hulu Plus. It's only <laughs> Although, send your like one cent. <laughs> with to help right. pay for it because right, right. it's only seven dollars a month, <laughs> but yeah. So I, I I watch on my iPod when I'm working out. You know, I'll throw I'll throw mm -hmm. in the iPod and just so it's a little tiny screen headphones right. in. But it works. But uh, you know, with the kids, I've got kids under seven, and and my wife doesn't really like those shows. So so that's the only time I get to watch anything like that. So no worries. <laughs> that that is the spokesperson for birth control right here. Right? You, you like sci-fi? Kids under seven. Me... Well, that's not. See, <laughs> see, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I'd actually take issue with that because my son is a huge geek. He's four oh, years nice. old, yeah. and he's a huge Transformers fan. Uh, loves, uh, you know, Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles and uh, She-Ra and He-Man and uh, Eon Kid and uh, oh, what other things? Uh, Sonic and some of the other stuff that nice. really is kind of geeky nature. 
Um, and uh, we'll watch uh, some some Star Trek with me, but not not often. So. I'll sometimes put I have the first series, you know, of Star Trek. I'll put that on all on VHS because I'm just. I'm old school. Right, no, okay. right, right. Because right. <laughs> no. you like the grainy feel. I like the grainy feel. It makes me feel like I'm actually in the 1960s. <laughs> so, right. So, right. But uh, they'll sit and watch those with me. Where you can see the coffee stain on Spock. Yeah. Sure, got it. <laughs> so you bring up Transformers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, let's talk about uh, the murder of culture that... Um, the Michael Bay's doing Michael right Bay now. Is doing right now. <laughs> you know, I've only been cursory. I've only been paying a cursory attention to that. But he, uh, he's been giving crap for renaming it. I guess that kind of the just. Yeah, well, he's called. He says it's going to be called Ninja Turtles now, and they're dropping the teenage mutant part because they're aliens, which takes away the, them being mutants. And right. And my inner child is screaming. Yeah, you know what? I, there's a lot of our listeners that are saying that. Um, is nothing from our childhood sacred? You know, that sort of deal. And I love the Transformers movies, though. I was oh, yeah. going to say that Keith hates them, but I love them. I, I did not say that I hate them. I have a friend that hates them. I liked the first one. I hated the second one, and I liked the third one. I have not watched the third one yet. Yes. So. Third, third one's good. Third yeah. one was not as good as the hey, first one. Hey, all I know is that Leonard Nimoy's in it, so I'm there yep. for the third <laughs> one. So, uh, second one was okay. I, there were some parts of it I didn't like. Uh, the two comedic robots that could have... Yeah, yeah she did away with. But well, here's the second one. I just thought like yeah. they had like twelve writers, and none of them were allowed to communicate while they were writing. right, right, exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> Although I did like was Blackbeard, the little black uh, plane, the that, jet. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was kind of cool, but dark. What was it? Uh, I forget. Uh, I forget the character's name. Anyway. Right, we're losing all sorts of geek cred here. <laughs> good, this is not a science fiction podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we have to hand in our geek card. <laughs> Well, Scott, thanks so much for coming on the show. If people want to get in touch with you and learn about the podcast, how can they do that? The best place is the sci-fi diner podcast.com. It has information to our Twitter handle, which is at sci-fi diner, uh, our Facebook fan page, facebook.com backslash sci-fi diner. I think it's sci-fi diner. And, uh, you can also find us on YouTube at the sci-fi diner pod It's actually YouTube backslash sci-fi diner podcast or something like that. So a couple places you can get a hold of us and, um, and uh, feel free to email us, chat with us, and if you're into sci-fi, and if you're not, if you just want to check us out, we'd love to have you come join us a little bit. So we have a pretty thriving community. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. We hope you've been enjoying the Lancast. This episode was produced by myself, David Moulton, with show notes by Keith and Lawrence Lesser. All pertinent links to this episode can be found in the show notes at thelancast.com. If you specifically like this episode, we ask that you consider making a donation. Every little bit helps. Even a dollar a show can keep us going. If you'd like to help support us, you can do so by going to thelancast.com slash donate. And don't forget to subscribe in iTunes and tell a friend about the show. So for the Lancast, I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slesser. Asking, are you in the cast? Are you in the cast?